Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my first question relates to the to AFMA's change to the consultation process for the, the small pelagic fishery. Uh, Friday, you announced that the small pelagic fishery would be monitored by a new scientific panel with stakeholder forums as part of a two-year trial. Um, is, this the, is this the only fishery you're conducting this, this new process on? Uh, Nick Raines, Executive Manager of Fisheries, AFMA. Yep. Uh, Senator, yes, this is the uh, fishery we're trialling this approach on. That is correct. Um, we have decided to do so because of uh, concerns expressed by uh, stakeholders for more engagement in that process in terms of the scientific and economic advice. And so we've adopted a, a different structure for a trial period of two years to see if that can work. So the Resource Assessment Group doesn't exist any longer then? The original Resource Assessment yep. Group doesn't exist. It ended its natural term on the 30th of June this year. And uh, the advice, however, that goes to AFMA and the Commission will continue via the stakeholder process and the scientific panel. So that stakeholder process, you're going to hold forums for different stakeholders, is that the plan? Uh, no, we, we hope, what we want to do is hold an open stakeholder forum for all stakeholders to attend. They can register to attend. It doesn't matter whether from the commercial fishing industry, environmental conservation groups, rec fishers, etc. Okay, so they're open, they're, 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 for, the pub, they're for the public, they're uh, not? Not public. We, we want to make sure that we have a, a degree of, um, I guess, understanding of, of uh, what wants to be discussed, who can turn up, those sort of things. So we have some, uh, we have a, we'll have a registration process essentially, Senator, to make sure that we have a degree of control over the uh, stakeholder forum. But it is open to any person to register for that forum, yes. Okay. Would it be fair to say that the resource assessment group for this, this fishery has been dogged by lots of controversy in recent times, for example, with the resignation of Dr Davies? I think so, that's... Citing conflicts of interest and political interference? Well, I'm not sure about the latter points in political mm. interference. However, the certainly true that Dr Davies had some concerns about the interests of some of the members of the RAG, the resource assessment group at the time. She expressed those to us. Uh, some, mem some members being Ger Jerry Jean, who the, one of the proponents of Seafish. Uh, yes, he's one of the industry members on the RAG, or was, and uh, also, but also a number of other matters have been expressed in terms of concern have been expressed around the involvement of a broader group of people in the resource assessment process, and the fact that a lot of people have an interest in this fishery, and we were trying to find a better way of actually engaging a broader group of people. And that's, that's what we're trying to do with the panel and the stakeholder forums. Was, um, was uh, Anissa Lawrence also in the resource assessment group for the small pelagic fishery? Uh, no, Senator, she isn't, but she is on the South East Management Advisory Committee. Okay, so could you just briefly explain the, what, what the role of that committee was? Okay, so the South East Fishery Management, South East Management Advisory Committee is a committee that reports to the AFMA Commission and also AFMA itself as a body. It's formed under the legislation, so management advisory committees are statutory bodies. The members are appointed by the commission and they relate to uh, particular fisheries which they have some responsibility for providing advice on. In the case of the South East management, management Advisory Committee, one of the fisheries it provides advice to the commission on is the small pelagic fishery. Its role, unlike the RAG which focuses on the science, is to take a broader view and look at other issues that may be facing the fishery. They could be of a, perhaps an economic or a, a broader nature in terms of the stakeholder interests on that group. So um, I was asked, uh, I can't remember how long ago, maybe some months ago, about a Freedom of Information uh, request <coughs> that the ABC had received concerning her frustration uh, over receiving an email from you about seal and dolphin deaths. I understand she was a is she an environmental rep representative? She's a conservation position? member on the MAC, that is correct. So what, how did that occur that she wasn't factored into the, the situation or the decision-making process around those uh, presumably unexpected dolphin and seal deaths around the arrival of the vessel? Sorry, I said I'm a little unclear about, about your point, but uh, Anissa well, Lawrence expresses... is, tr is treated in the same way as other MAC members are in terms of their access to advice and information. Um, well, I think it's fair to say from time to time many 
MAC and RAG members can express frustration about particular issues. We have over a dozen RAGs and, and uh, six or seven MACs. I've combined there are 150 odd people on those groups. From time to time, yes, individuals do express frustration about particular issues, and, and I don't think uh, Ms Lawrence is any exception to that in this case. Okay. Um, think, thinking back over the last few years, uh, Dr Ryans, we obviously had a lot of controversy around the arrival of the Margiris, and we went through a, uh, a process where an independent scientific panel was set up to look at issues around this fishing activity uh, of, of, a, of a super trawler. Um, presumably, it was you knew it was going to be a very sensitive issue when that boat arrived, that issues like bycatch of seals and dolphins was going to be a matter of significant public interest, but you, AFMA didn't think it was, you, you didn't think it was necessary to contact your environmental representative and uh, let them know that there'd been these mortalities when the, when the new trawler arrived? Well, I think that the Magiris, of course, didn't actually fish, Senator. It's, it's a Geelong start. I understand it's a Geelong start, fishing. Dr Ryan. I'm saying the first boat was the Margiris, but the new trawler that arrived was still a matter of controversy and public interest. That's, that's correct, and the Management Advisory Committee was informed of, of the, the arrival of the vessel. It was also participated in the discussions around advice to the Commission on the science. Uh, the RAG advice, by the way, goes through the MAC to the Commission, so that also was picked up. Um, I think it's also fair to say that uh, most of our fisheries do have interactions with protected species. And some of those do include seals and dolphins. As many so in that sense, that, 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 those interactions are not unusual or unique to this particular fishery. No, I understand they're not unique to fishing in general, but are they more prevalent in the small pelagic fishery? Uh, no, Senator, they're not. So f having 40 seals around a net is, is common for other fishing activities, is uh, it? Yes, Senator, it is. OK, and, and do they have suffer similar mortality rates? Yes, Senator, they do. And that, they just don't get reported? They get, all get reported, Senator. We're required to report them under law. Every quarter we publish those numbers for all of our fisheries. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that what we've seen with the Geelong Star since its arrival uh, is, is very similar to what we've seen in other fishing activities, but the so, Australian public's just not aware of that? Well, the Australian public can be aware of it if it reads the published reports that we put out every quarter, Senator. Um, fishing of many forms interacts with protected species, be they seabirds, seals or dolphins. Mm. Some fishery types interact with certain types of protected species more than others, and trawling particularly interacts with species like seals and dolphins. Okay. But the, the, the idea that we can actually have no deaths in our fisheries of any protected species isn't realistic. What we do do is take measures to try and reduce and minimise those where we can using a okay. suite of mitigation tools that are available to the well, fishing can we, industry can we, can we talk? We can talk about those, because I've got no doubt both AFMA and the proponent would have liked to have minimised the deaths of seals and, and, and dolphins. <coughs> when, when the Geelong Star arrived uh, in, in <coughs> April and went fishing, were you, were you confident that the seal exclusion device w was, was suitable? Uh, yes, we had experience with similar devices, uh, for example, in the winter blue grenadier fishery off the west coast of Tasmania. And over a number of years, that fishery had managed to significantly re reduce its seal interactions using a similar device. And so, yes, we had, we had hoped and had good prospects that a similar device on the Geelong Star, which was using a similar midwater trawl net, would have good outcomes for the fishery, yes. But that didn't turn out to be the case? Well, the interaction rates were higher than we had hoped for. As I said, most fisheries, or well, a lot of fisheries we have, do have seal interactions, and so we weren't expecting zero, but yes, they were higher than we'd hoped for, and that is why we've tightened the arrangements for, this, for that fishery and that vessel. So in that FOI that I just mentioned, uh, I won't mention the name of uh, one of the employees, he quoted, uh, I'm not really sure there's much more we can do to stop them. Um, on haul, we have about 20 to 30 currently feeding around the net. Yes, that, that's what happens. And the, the reality is, is what we have to do are several things. One is you can't keep seals away from a fishing boat. It's very hard to do. What you can do is put in place mitigation that's measures right. to stop them getting caught in the net. And also, if they are caught in the net, have on-board procedures to make sure that as many animals can be released alive as possible, and that's what okay. we do. So in relation to those mitigation uh, measures that you take, I understand uh, 
site is important, looking at dolt, looking at cetaceans and seals around the area of activity. Mm. Um, is that why you implemented a night ban on fishing following these mortalities well, the, or interactions, the, as you call them? The, 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 so I should actually add, not all interactions are mortalities. So we have, mm -hmm. we have there's a, a difference. You can throw them back in the sea if they're still alive. They're not thrown back in the well, centre. Well, there are actually quite careful procedures okay. required to release animals from nets and other fishing gear to place them carefully back in the water. And bearing in mind, boats like the Geelong Star now have cameras on board. We know exactly what's going on. So mm. people are very careful. So, sorry, could you, could you answer my question on that? So, line of, so site is important. Is that so why, is that why you implemented one, one of a band? number of ways, yes. Um, there, is, there are also uh, other measures that are used in terms of having a, a seal excluded device in the net. Um, there, there are, um, we have, the, of course, in this case, the barrier net that was used and trialled on the vessel for quite some time to see if that would assist in not catching dolphins or seals. Uh, we've also uh, got the one dolphin trigger, so there's a real incentive for the vessel to make sure that it gets it right, because if it gets it wrong, an entire part of the fishery is closed for a period of uh, six months. So, so you implemented night, not a, night, a night ban on fishing for the Geelong yes. Star. Did that work? Um, it worked in the sense that it, it uh, didn't lead to any further dolphin mortalities. However, it also, we have to balance that with enabling the vessel to fish and bearing in mind that we're trying to balance a set of regulations to make sure we're protecting species, protected species, and at the same time reasonably allowing the, the vessel to fish. And on that matter, um, as you may be aware, we took advice from uh, the experts who met and discussed the, the sort of set of arrangements we had for the Geelong Star in particular in the small pelagic fishery. And their advice was that basically having both a, a, um, a nighttime ban and also all the other mitigation measures in place and a one dolphin trigger limit was probably too much. So we remove the nighttime ban as part of that. Too much process. with the balance falling in favour of the companies, the economics of well, that fishing. Well, Senator, the, the one <coughs> dolphin trigger is pretty harsh. I mean, it does, that, that's a very harsh well, I measure. I think a lot of take. Australians would disagree with you, Dr Ryan. Well, a lot of Australians well, don't want to see dolphins being killed well, we, we by don't fishing either. activities. But, but, you, but you've got to give the, the fishing industry some incentive to get the thing right. Um, if you give them no choice and know where to go, they're not going to improve their practices. And one of the things we do in all our fisheries is seek to work with the fishing industry to improve their practices, be it for dolphins, seals, sea snakes, seabirds, you name it. There's a long list of species we're working with the fishing industry on to make sure we don't cause these interactions to occur and try and minimise them to the extent we can. So freedom of information documents that we, we, we obtained uh, suggested that I'm happy to give you copies of these if you don't if you don't have them. That uh, when reviewing underwater video footage and watching <coughs> halls, a substantial amount of target species was seen being lost through the SED seal uh, device escape opening. This was estimated to be 30% a substantial economic loss. Uh, considering the strong swimming ability of small pelagics, it would be very difficult to neg negate this loss with the current technology. To make up for this loss of fish a vessel fishing the SPF would need to undertake additional fishing effort. It sounds to me like that was a very clear recommendation from the, from the boat, from the crew, that the mitigation measures in place weren't economic for them. <coughs> that, and that includes just the device, let alone not nighttime fishing. Senator, I, I think that the, the issue there is what I've just been saying, is that getting that balance right. You know, if, you, if you have, if, if you're purely commercially focused, you could rightly argue that all the mitigation should be removed because it maximises the fish you can get in your net. That's not what we're doing here. We're trying to get a balance between a boat that can economically fish, and at the same time we protect species that may come into contact with that net, be they seals, dolphins or anything else. Did, did you have, uh, or did AFMA have any discussions with the Department of Environment when you lifted the night fishing ban for the Geelong Star? Yes, Senator, that we, we were, they were made aware of, the, of our intention to do so and the basis for it. But, you, but the, the one dolphin kill policy still remains in place? Correct, it does. Okay. How, has there been any mortality since, since you've lifted? Uh, of dolphins? No, yes, Senator, dolphins. There, there has not. And if there were, then it would, pro would obviously, <coughs> under the current arrangement, lead to the closure of another area of the fishery. And, and, and what about seals? 
but there has been one additional seal mortality. Okay. So when you, when the boat came to uh, Albany, it then fished and travelled to Geelong. <coughs> then it, after it left Geelong, there was other issues with dolphin mortalities and, and the, the seal exclusion device. Uh, did you send, or did, did the operators send away for equipment from Holland, was it? I, th I think they may have done, Senator, I'd have to check, but I know that they have um, uh, experts on board of their own who are net makers and gear designers, and they may well have sought advice and they may well have sought gear from overseas, yes. So I can't, I'd like to take it on notice just to check, but mm. I know that was part of their strategy was to help them improve the uh, gear they were using. Okay. Um, in terms of by, uh, other bycatch, um, did AFMA have some sort of predicted level of bycatch around this kind of fishing activity um, before, before the boat arrived? It's, it's a hard thing to predict because <coughs> we had had some experience, as you know, many, many years ago, back in the 1980s, with some interactions between dolphins and midwater trawl gear. And clearly that was unacceptable and we didn't want to repeat that. Our subsequent experience in the winter blue grenadier fishery, which has some similarities, as I've said, with the small pelagic fishery in midwater trawl, was that over time we've been able to get the seal interaction rates and, and, and general marine mammal interaction rates down to a very low level. In fact, some years it got down to zero. So we were, we were quite positive that everybody had learned a lot, the industry had learned a lot, and we had as regulators that when we saw this boat coming to the fishery, we had a reasonable expectation that it would have minimal interaction, not zero, but minimal interaction with marine mammals. Mm, okay. Could you give us a, a, an idea of um, the, the catch, the, the small pelagics, what, what's happened to that? And from, from the, the Geelong the Star, Senator? From the Geelong Star, yeah. Is it, last time I think I asked you this question, you said it had gone to be, it was put in freezing capacity. It was in storage, cold storage. Uh, do you know, so do you know catch, what's yeah, happened? Yes, yeah, so what, what's happened to the catch since it's come ashore? Yeah. It, as far as I know, it's still in, in, I'm not sure it's travelled anywhere yet, Senator. I'm not sure. When, when would you be sure of that? Well, I'd, I'd have to take it on notice, Senator, about what's happened to that fish, whether it's still in cold storage in Australia, or whether it's gone to markets overseas. Okay, but that, that is your expectation still, that it's going to go to market overseas? Uh, market Senator, so Dr James Finlay, CEO of AFMA, um, I think, to be fair to the company, that, that some of that material is commercial incompetence, and I don't mm. think it's appropriate for us to make comment on that here. Um, we don't hold that information, and we don't actually collect that information. So You don't track the... I, I, my, understand, AFMA's I responsible. my understanding was that you did track. No, AFMA's responsible for the fishing activity, and once the fish gets to the wharf, AFMA's responsibility generally stops. Um, so in this occasion, we might be able to give you some information um, if the company's made that available in the public domain or is willing to put it in the public domain, but um, mm. it's not something we have at no. the moment and um, wouldn't be able to provide you uh, in so normal circumstances. We, uh, a couple, couple of quick ones and then I'll finish. I'll put the other ones on notice. Um, in relation to uh, set, setting quotas <laughs> of to total allowable catch, uh, where are we at with setting quotas for the next fishing season? Okay, so the... Um, the, the process, uh, the fishing season starts on 1 May next year, Senator, so the process from here is to form the new scientific panel, hmm. um, hold the stakeholder forums as part of that process of, of, of determining the next round of uh, TAC advice to go to the uh, Commission for its, its decision making. Um, at this stage we, we are awaiting some new scientific advice on, on several fish stocks that um, has yet to come into us from uh, some of the research groups. So that'll be additional and new information to help us form those TACs for next year. And that information would be uh, field, field, cl cl information uh, yes, collected it's in from field? from sur field surveys. So there's been a, there were several surveys done recently. We, we're waiting for the last of that information to come through to us to be used in the assessment process. Okay. Two, two, two quick questions, Chair. Um, just in relation to um, the, the AFMA monitoring of... of and we've also, we also noticed this on the, the Freedom of Information <coughs> documents that we received, that you are monitoring the location of the Rainbow Warrior, the Greenpeace boat, no. and communicating to the crew, no, so, communicating so. to the Geelong Star the location of the Greenpeace boat. So our officers are aboard those vessels. Um, as part of communication with our officers, we did let them know that the uh, Greenpeace vessel was nearby. Um, we have a duty of care to our officers aboard those vessels, and you'll be aware of various altercations between um, Greenpeace and other activist ships and some fishing vessels over time, and that's why we brought that information to their attention. Um, so you, you I have a duty of care to those officers, and I take that very seriously. So you deem Greenpeace to be a, a threat to... 
I wouldn't want to get hit by a water cannon. I don't think Greenpeace has ever used a water cannon that I know of. Have but they got one on board? Yeah. My uh, risk assessment okay. was that that was important information for my officers aboard that And vessel. what did you base that on, Dr Finlay? Uh, well, various activities of various groups, unfortunately, uh, Senator, have resulted in a number of threats being made to AFMA and AFMA staff uh, during from, this from activity. From Greenpeace? Uh, well, no, no. I, I, I'm not uh, saying that they were from Greenpeace, but um, there were various threats made to AFMA and AFMA staff as a part of the protests in 2012 and in 14 and, and uh, 15, unfortunately. And um, I thought this was important information for those officers to have. And, and what about um, offshore fishing competitions, recreational fishing competitions? Is, were the location of fishing competitions discussed between the uh, Geelong Star Crew and AFMA personnel as well as areas to be avoided in case of uh, bad publicity or perhaps being, being uh, or interactions, if you don't mind me using that word, between wreck fishermen and... Well, look, the, the vast majority of those uh, competitions had finished by the time the Geelong Star started activities this year, so I doubt those communications have gone on, but I'd have to take that on.